Welcome, everybody. As we all know, these are turbulent times in the home building world, uh, the RV world in particular. A lot has been happening with Vans Aircraft in the past few months, really the past couple of years. And, and we thought it was time to get a few seasoned veterans of the RV home building uh, together and, and chat about the latest technical data that is coming out of Aurora on the laser cut uh, parts wow. issue. You know, we're not here to talk about bankruptcy, um, although that is, of course, a background to everything that's going on. Uh, and we're not talking about the quick build primary issues. We're not talking about production, finances, or any of that. We, we really want to zero in on the engineering analysis that's been done regarding, regarding the laser cut parts issue and, and, and the things that cropped up last year. You know, in my work with the space program, um, we had a saying that said, when confronted with a new problem, the first answer is always wrong. And that just seems to always be true with engineering, with engineering stuff. Um, and, it, and it was certainly true here. People see a problem, they immediately propose solutions and causes and the like. But until the engineers and the technicians start digging down into the actual data and do testing, you really don't know what's coming up, what, what you've got, and you really can't come up with a well thought out solution. Um, we've got a lot of the new data. It's been it's been put out and um, our panel has had a chance to kind of digest that. So let's go around the virtual room and I'll introduce everybody and then we'll dive right in. So uh, we first off, we've got uh, James Clark. James is a graduate of MIT, both undergrad and graduate, a former executive director of Bell Labs, the chief technical officer of AT&T NCR and a university president. He served on over a dozen boards and foundations, including the Experimental Aircraft Association Board of Directors. Back in 2002, he and his friends finished the red and white RV-6 that graced the posters at EAA, honoring the 30th anniversary of the world's most popular kit, as well as the I Flew My Plane to Air Venture t-shirts this past year. Uh, so if it's familiar, that's where it's from. He's currently finishing an RV-6A that was delayed by life's events some 20 plus years ago. And relevant to this effort, he has successfully intervened and turned around significantly highly technical business ventures. So welcome aboard, James. That's pretty impressive. Then uh, in another corner, we've got Steve Smith. Uh, Steve uh, is a retired aerospace scientist, having worked for over 33 years at the NASA Ames Research Center in applied aerodynamics and design of novel vehicle concepts, some of them very novel, let me tell you. He split his time about equally between experimental research, computational analysis, and numerical shape optimization. Designing novel aircraft concepts often required high fidelity structural modeling, as well as configuration aerodynamics. Steve later worked at Z.Aero, developing electric VTOL urban mobility aircraft. And in the general aviation world, Steve is known for designing the airfoil for the RV-10, as well as performance modifications for racing aircraft. Uh, Steve earned a uh, bachelor's in aeronautical engineering from UC Davis in 79 and a PhD in applied aerodynamics from Stanford in 1995. He's authored over 40 technical papers, including about a dozen peer reviewed journal articles. He flies an RV-8 that he completed in 2009, as well as an LS-6 15 meter class sailplane. Uh, he holds a private pilot rating in both single engine and gliders with uh, 3000 hours total time. And then uh, in our final corner, we've got Vic. Uh, Vic Syracuse has built uh, 12 aircraft over 43 years. You, you really need to step up the pace there, Vic. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Six of which, six of which were RVs. Uh, he's a DAR and a contributor to kit planes and sport aviation. He's published three books on amateur built aircraft, very good ones. He founded Base Leg Aviation in 2007, which has become the premier provider of maintenance supports for RVs. He served on the board of directors of EAA and as the chairman of the Home Built Council. He's a commercial pilot with 11,000 hours across 74 different types of aircraft, and, and he's an ANP IA, a tech counselor and a flight advisor. And then I'm just going to be your moderator today. Um, I'm Paul Dye, uh, Kit Plane's editor at large. I retired as a lead flight director for NASA's human space flight program. I flew shuttle and space station with 40 years of aerospace experience on everything from Cubs to the space shuttle. Uh, I'm a, a longtime home builder. I began flying and working on airplanes as a teenager, and I've had experience with a wide range of construction techniques and materials in a lot of different companies. Um, I fly a variety of our own aircraft, of having built six uh, of them. I've, I've got three RVs. Uh, we're currently working on an F-1 rocket. Uh, I've got a commercial uh, pilot's license. I've logged about 6,000 hours in about 160 different types of aircraft. 
uh, and I'm an a and an EA tech counselor and flight advisor, and I was formerly on the uh, the Home Builders Council with, with Vic. So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, I'll just talk for a couple more minutes, and then we'll get everybody involved. You know, <clears throat> the laser cut parts issue, for those who haven't been informed, started uh, Vans a air aircraft saw an unprecedented increase in demand for kits in the past few years, and it was triggered by a number of, number of global events. Uh, Vans has been in business for about 50 years and, and, and has seen enormous growth in that time, but nothing like that brought on by the early 2020s. Uh, this meant that they had to come up with a quick way to ramp up production, and in quickly increasing their capacity, they kind of outsourced a bunch of sheet metal fabrication, something they hadn't really done before. And this unfortunately led to some issues when it came to laser cut parts. Cracks started being discovered by builders during the dimpling process and the report started to grow. And that really kicked off the research phase, the engineering research phase at Vans. Traditionally, Vans had, had punched most of their parts. And while they have used laser cutting in the past for certain parts, most of their holes were done on punch presses. Uh, laser cutting holes in thick in thick sheet metal was some or in thin sheet metal was you know, somewhat new to their process. With parts going out into the field, they start getting reports of misshaped holes, holes with little notches in them, and holes that cracked on the edges of dimples. And this kicked off that engineering effort, and that's what we're here to talk about. Um, so Steve, Vic, and James all had a chance to attend a presentation of the data at uh, Vans headquarters a couple weeks ago. Um, I was unfortunately out of pocket, so I didn't get to go, and I'm kind of jealous of you guys uh, getting to see that in purpose in, uh, in person. But we'd like to talk a little bit about what they saw, how they view the data, and what it means to the community. So let's start with Steve, our, our, our strong engineering rep here. Uh, Steve, you've been doing detailed aeronautical engineering for a career. You've done not just aerodynamics, but a lot of detailed nut, bolt, and rivet engineering. Why don't you start us off? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I want to just say how impressed I am with the, the level and detail of the testing regimen at Vans. Uh, the testing and the analysis they're doing is comparable to what you'd expect to see in the certified world. And it, it's not just that they started doing this testing after the dimple cracking was reported. Uh, they actually um, have quite a long legacy of testing, not just structural testing, but fatigue testing as well. They, um, they had actually tested the, the laser cut parts candidates prior to putting them into production and found that they had equivalent service life to their punched hole parts. So um, what the exhaustive testing that they've done up till now, what we saw a few weeks ago, really confirms that for a wide variety of parts assemblies and a wide range of realistic load conditions, that these parts, the laser cut parts, really are functionally equivalent. And um, they've found that when parts are tested until fatigue cracks occur, the cracks do not originate at the manufactured cracks at the dimple hole edges, uh, nor do they tend to travel to them. If anything, they tend to avoid those cracks and run around to other places. So we saw that in the wide range of specimens that they showed us on our visit. Okay, that's pretty succinct. Um, Vic, you look at more RVs and you license more of them than any man I, I know. Um, you've done more pre-purchase inspections on experienced RVs than anyone I know. What, what's your take on this from the field? So, you know, I, uh, it was interesting going actually to vans, going up to the mountain, so to say, and actually see things firsthand. It was a real eye opener for me. I actually came out of there thinking, you know, if I were building a quick build right now, I'd just go ahead and finish building it. Uh, if Van sends the parts to me, I, I'd have to be tempted to just put them on the shelf and not even be concerned about it. Because from what I saw, there was no significant impact on airframe life. And the fact that they verified that with an outside vendor was pretty impressive. When you see those lines overlap e with each other, you know the testing is done right, both by Vans and obviously by the company that's certified doing that. You know, for our whole life, those of us who have been working or playing with metal airplanes, we all, you know, we've all been pre-programmed to believe that cracks are bad. Right. And, you know, there's lots of service bulletins out there for cracks on metal airplanes and what to do about it, et cetera. And, you know, you get to a certain stage of life and you think, wow, I might know just about everything right now. And we all walked out of there thinking and understanding that all cracks aren't created equal. That was an eye opener for me. 
there's a real big difference between a fatigue crack and a manufactured crack. These LCP parts have manufactured cracks. And by now you've all seen the demonstration or the presentation showing that the actual cracks, the fatigue cracks, they don't care about the manufactured cracks. They don't even get there, as Steve said. So uh, that was pretty that was pretty exciting to see that and, and a big relief, quite candidly. And you know, on top of that, if you look at the number of service bulletins that vans and other metal aircraft manufacturers have put out over the years around cracking, vans has a history. They've been very astute on some of the service problems out there relative to cracking, and they've put out service bulletins. I think you saw in the presentation the number that they've done. I actually see no reason why that wouldn't continue down the road. Obviously, everybody is going to be kind of, you know, uh, tuned into the LCP parts. But right now, I don't see that it's a big impact. I'm certainly not concerned about it. It's, that, that's pretty interesting. Steve, you got anything something to add you wanted to add on that? I, I agree. Um, you know, especially given the, um, the expected life, serve airframe service life answers that they're coming up with are many, many times the useful lifespan of typical airplanes. And this is even with the assumption of really extremely harsh, um, you know, life load exposure. So, um, although, you know, in, in many cases, the parts that Van is recommending replacing just out of an abundance of caution, a lot of those parts aren't that difficult to replace. So I think if I had a quick build kit. I think I probably would go ahead and replace those. But personally, I agree with Vic. I think I would have no qualms at all based on what they've showed us of going ahead and just building that airplane and flying it. One of the things that's been talked a lot about is, is what effect these LCPs might have on resale value. And uh, I know kind of both Vic and, and, uh, and James have a lot of background in business um james uh what are your thoughts uh on on what this might do to people to airplanes resale values well look, i'd like to start out by saying that i too like uh Vic and steve was thoroughly impressed with the engineering work that was being done at done at vans you know i went there with an open mind i actually had not been there before and so just walking around and seeing the extensive work that they've done the the engineering was really 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 impressed and so in the short term, from a business standpoint, whenever there's a phenomenon that pops up, there's a lot, there's a flurry of activity, there's a flurry of dialogue, and and so it's at the top of mind because you can have uh, people that are feel e emotionally affected, you know, might be very very vocal, and some that are more financially affected, very very vocal. I think in the long term that that is not what people are going to be talking about for that. They're going to be talking about whether or not they have the, the engine is the latest, you know, Thunderboat painted purple with the, you know, uh, right kind of lifters and whether or not the prop is the right one and the electronic ignition is the right one and the latest Garmin doodads and the interior is is uh, the, the finest vegan leather, okay? And that's what's going to set the value of a lot of these things in the, in the, in the long term uh, and, and because it's, it settles out over time. Now, of sure. course, Vic, is touching planes today and tomorrow and then and the next day. And he's the one that will hear from people right now. But in the yeah. past, when companies have worked their way through these types of these types of issues, the value comes back. And once people put pencil to paper and compare the RVs to any other plane that's out there, they are not going to find anything that comes close to the value of those planes. And that's how it's going to settle out once they see the engineering results. Okay, Vic. What are your thoughts on resale? You you you're involved in an awful lot of airplanes changing hands. Yeah, quite candidly, I you know I'm there with James. I think uh, you know as we've seen from the presentation already, these airframes are going to outlast us. So yeah. a well constructed airframe should not be a problem. Quite candidly, in the process of doing my DAR activities and pre buy, I see uh, just some are just so poorly constructed. The LCP wouldn't even rank up there with uh some of the issues that i see you know the, just this week we had one came that had a leaking fuel line from the right main tank to the fuselage and you, you pull it off and look at it and the line had never been flared and, <laughs> and 
Wow. And, and, and so we started looking, and sure enough, none of the lines had been flared. It was amazing they didn't have more leaks. And, you know, that's just one example. I see all kinds of things out there with tails not adequately attached or, you know, edge distance on longerons. There, there are other more serious things out there besides LCP. I, I honestly don't think it will rise to a discussion. Now, I do think that it will be a question that will be asked just because we've made this such a big, indis mm -hmm. uh, you know, just a, a, a big thing right now around the RVs, right? So I think the question, you know, during the sales process may be asked. I think it would be appropriate for the selling party to discuss or, or you know, divulge, yeah, I did replace the parts or I didn't. Would it matter? No, from what I saw, we should be able to see, you know, if the LCP parts are causing any issues. I sincerely doubt, certainly in my lifetime, I'm going to find any that, that you know, may have problems and affect the sale. So I wouldn't be concerned. Oh, okay. That's a good, that's a good point of view. You know, I, I think that in the current state of kits and home building, an awful lot of new players except, expect that putting the airplane together is kind of an Ikea experience. And most of us started out when we had to build our smelter to, to, to refine the raw bauxite into aluminum. And so we look at it a little differently, but that there's neither right nor wrong there. I want to emphasize that, that, that things change. Uh, but, you know, some of the older airplanes, Vic, that I looked at, yeah. Here, that have been flying for 40 years, you look at them and you go, how in the world did they ever last that long? And it just shows how much margin there is in the, in the design. Um, well, that's the point that I wanted to add to, Paul, that that if you look at the planes that are out there right now, first of all, these planes with the laser cut parts, if all of the analysis that we saw is correct, these planes are going to last five of our lifetimes of flying. Okay, so let's, 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 let's put that out there. The second thing uh, is that the planes that were built 20, 30 you know, 40 years ago, probably with wobbly drill bits and lines that were not straight and the, and the rivets are probably hammered with, with, with sledgehammers, all right, they, they're still out there out there flying and continue to, to fly. And so if I were going to buy a plane from someone right now, there, there, there's dozens of other things that I would worry about far before. If it had LCP somewhere on it, there's got parts that would be way, 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 you know, Number fifty-eight that I would look at. There's a lot of things that I, I'd be worried about what a builder did or didn't do with these yeah. precisely cut parts that they that they're using today. Yeah. If I if I if I could add something to that to what James yeah. was saying, Paul, a, a story that that just you know it, it hit home when we were out there uh, at Vans when I built my RV4 back in the '80s. That was a time when we had to take. Uh, all the parts to the FISDO or the FISDO had to come out and inspect our aircraft before it was closed up. Today, we don't do any inspections until the DAR or the FISDO person comes out and does the inspection. Back then, we had to get it inspected. So I dutifully took my tail down to the FISDO and watched him inspect it. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing quite candidly, but he looked at me and said, what are you building, a tank? <laughs> And I, I kind of, I, I didn't understand the question. I looked at him, I said, well, I'm just building it according to the plans. And I had taken the plans to show him, of course. But it was interesting. When I got back to, I was flight instructing part-time back then, I, I went in and looked at a, a Piper that was in a 100-hour inspection. So everything was opened up. And I was kind of shocked at how, in my mind now, that thing was just barely put together. It was pretty weak. And it drove home the point to me all, through all these years and all the other RVs that I've that I've built and inspected, they really are overbuilt to begin with. Yeah, and I think that probably allows for the construction errors and things that James had mentioned and we've all seen, but they're overbuilt to begin with. So it's not like we're hanging on the edge in this one little hole that's got an LCP crack and it's going to cause the whole thing to come yeah, apart. I, I, uh, I, I always tell people that if you ever get a chance to fly on a B-17 or a B-29 or a B-25, <laughs> don't look too closely at the rivets on your way in of that 70-year-old airplane. Just yeah, don't. Yes, okay? yes. But, but it has been yeah. flying for 70 years, so take that into account. You know? uh, uh, if I may, Paul, one other very yeah. quick technical thing that Vic mentioned. Uh, and I don't know if we'll get into it, but something that we saw out there where Vans had, where they had every other rivet and saw the ribs and almost in half and so forth, and the and the wing still serviced flying an airplane home. I, yeah. You know, 
with half the parts not there, not working. And that shows how it's overbuilt. And if anyone, if you mentioned the Piper. Uh, if anyone remembers Bill Benedict, I too, like Vic, early on, I was so, I mean, I was so worried about everything. He said, you, you like your Piper? Yeah, it flies great? Yeah. Go, go over there and measure this and compare the rivets and everything against what you're doing. You know, it's like, you know, this, the, the design is so robust. It's, it, it, it allows itself to, uh, 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 to be built by us amateurs and still, and still be one of the strongest planes that we'll actually ever fly. Yeah. You know, I'm going to steal a few lines, you know, Steve, what do you think you would say for, for years? We've been looking at, at, at admonishing people to, 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 to not have any cracks and smooth every single edge. And it's got to be built perfect. And, you know, the widely accepted standards of workmanship admonish builders to carefully deburr all the whole edges and smooth edges to avoid cracking. What do you got to say about the fact that we're now kind of saying, well, a few cracks are probably OK, Steve? Well, it, it's, it seems to me that much of that guidance existed in the absence of any real thorough testing to establish when and where it really matters. So I think builders should obviously strive for good workmanship and follow best practices, even though we now know that in these specific instances where these edge cracks are appearing as manufactured cracks when the holes are dimpled, it just doesn't appear to be a problem. Uh, that is, doesn't mean you can just automatically ignore, uh, you know, every other precaution that you might take. You, sh you should still do your best to, to build a good solid airplane. But, I mean, the data shows that in this particular case, it just isn't quite as much of a worry as it might have been thought of in the past. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if I could add on to that. Yeah, yeah. Paul, you know, the difference I think in the RV community is first off in the van's instructions, there are a number of pages that talk about, you know, working with metal and the edge deburring and deburring the holes and doing all that stuff proper. And then we have a whole community that talks and helps each other and sometimes get a little bit too anal for the lack of a better term about some of the construction processes. As a DAR, I got to tell you, I get to see quite a few other metal airplanes. And I've been shocked many, many times when I go look at them at the lack of deburring, whether it's edges, holes, priming, you name it. And, you know, I query and question and you get the deer in the headlight look because the manufacturer, the kit provider didn't, didn't educate them or say anything. So unknowingly, and because they don't have quite the form presence, et cetera, they just put it together the best they know how. I haven't seen any fall apart or crash yet. And the number of them are local. Okay. <laughs> and they've been out there quite a few years and they're doing okay. So it's uh, it's not as big a deal, but I agree dead on with Steve. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do best practices. James, you've been involved in major projects for a lot of large companies, both from an engineering yeah. perspective and the role of, of upper management. What's mm -hmm. your take on what on, on what Vans has shown in this data and how they've shown it to us and their approach yeah. to testing. Just take a minute. Well, um, well, first of all, whenever you have a problem like this, uh, especially technical, you got to, no, it doesn't matter if it's technical or not. You got to get the facts. You must get the facts because you got to get, get that right. On the other hand, you cannot take forever to get the facts because then you need to communicate early and often with your constituents, with your customers, to keep them up to up to up to date as to where you are, what you have, what facts you do have, what you know, and what you don't know, because to the extent that you create a vacuum and you do not share the information that you have, people will start making it up. They'll start filling in the holes themselves. Then you get rumors that are running, and you end up spending ten times as much time putting out fires that were unnecessarily uh, created. Now, um, once you have the facts and you're in the midst of communicating uh, early and often, frequently, then a company must do the right thing. And do the right thing is, it has to be at least within the constraints, uh, you know, within, within the confines of what they, what they can do. And so in this case, I would say on the, on, the, on the engineering, finding the facts, Vans probably gets an A+. Plus. On the communicate early and early and often, they probably get a D. All right, uh, you know, maybe a D minus. Uh, do the right thing. I think the desire of uh, just Vans himself and speaking from Vans and knowing Vans for decades, uh, his desire to do the right thing, I think, would be an A plus. 
uh, the ability to do what everyone perceives to be the right thing, they probably they'll probably end up with a B, and that's and and that B is probably going to be far greater than any other uh, provider uh, would would uh, would make available. You know, as a, as an example, I believe that uh, they've committed to the red and yellow parts. You know, making available uh, uh, to to everyone. Now, some people would say, well take all my parts back and give me all my money back and, and send me everything for free. You know, that's, that, no, you know, you, you wasted my time. Well, that's not going to happen. Okay. But I think that the organization is doing everything it possibly can. Uh, and they're going to be ramping up from what I understand on the communication, because that's the messaging is probably the, that has been their weakest point. Now, I want to put another wrapper around this. This problem is viewed from a corporate standpoint, initially, I think, as an engineering problem. This problem was not an engineering problem from my perspective. Uh, this problem was, is, is the type of thing that happens when a small company ends up having explosive growth and the management technique, the management processes necessary have not been put in place for a big, for a big league company. So you're operating on the model that you were successfully operating on when you are small and you go through that transition area, there's a transition area and you know, whether it's on a shuttle or whatever, where you hold your breath and you make it through there, you know, you're good to go. A lot of companies have had hiccups there and whether it was, you know, Tesla or Delta or, you know, you pick a company that, that have gone through areas where, or Apple, you know, a lot of people that are building RVs probably like their iPad and their iPhone and so forth. And Apple came very, very close to losing it all uh, because making that transition where you need to change the management style so you have processes that catch changes. What happened here was there were some changes that occurred and their processes didn't catch that change to throw a flag on the play to see what the impact would be for the rest of the company. And the machines were running fast and furious, cranking out stuff. And that impact became so great because the processes didn't catch it. You brought up an important point I want Vic to mention to tell me. You know, there was never a, a perfect spacecraft that we ever launched at NASA, and you've probably never seen a perfect airplane. And, and you know, I'm supposed to become a DAR here soon, and you're one of the old granddaddy <coughs> DARs. How does a person know that it's good enough? What's acceptable? Yeah, so here's the metric I use as a DAR when I go license an airplane. Would I fly it? And would I put my family in it? Yeah. It's that simple. As a matter of fact, I do make quite a few first flights in the ones that I license, so it's a very valid question. But uh, that should be the question that everybody asks them because, you know, all builders make that entry in the logbook. They are the ones who actually make the statement and sign it that says the aircraft is in a condition for safe operation. Now, granted, we're experimental aviation, but that's not what we're talking about today anymore. We're talking about aircraft that are put together, put families of four in them, go fly at night on instruments. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. the bar is a lot higher today than it was, you know, even a decade or so ago. And everybody should look themselves in the eye on their own airplane and have that same thing. Would I fly it? <laughs> Would I put my best friend or my family in it and let them go? To me, it's pretty simple. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to add on yeah. to James' comment there is, you know, I think the amateur built aviation, as we know, is growing, 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 and it's going to continue to grow for all kinds of reasons we don't need to get into here. But I think a good model around the QC process is one of the ones that we use in the certified world, and that's the service difficulty reports. I think, you know, there's got to be a way over time that all of the kit providers can capture what's going on in the field and actually use that as an extension of the QC process. You're not going to catch everything there at the factory. It just won't happen. You see things in play out there in the field, and we've got to have a feedback mechanism and then be able to react to that as well. That's all good stuff. I tell you what, I want to bring Steve back in here just a little bit. Um, Steve, both you and I have roots at NASA. I mean, we spent careers there. And, and one thing about NASA was that the testing and data were kings. Um, what makes you comfortable with the testing that Vans have done? And, and is there any additional testing that you wish you that they had done that you didn't see? 
So I would say there's uh, maybe four or five points there um, on, on their testing. Um, I think the first is their statistical sample size of the testings they've done. I think in general, their statistical sample size exceeds what I've seen typically in industry. Um, often in industry, they'll rely on a large statistical data set of just a few particular joint types or a few particular test coupons. And they'll use that data for design purposes. And then it's common going forward to have just one airframe that's undergoing continuous testing in the, in the back shop while the airplanes are out in service. And the goal there is for that one airframe to stay ahead of the fleet, so to speak, in its testing so that if an issue shows up, it would show up there first. But it's just one airframe. So I think the statistical sample size that they've used in their testing is remarkable. Uh, the variety of testing that they've done in terms of representing a lot of different types of parts assemblies and the variety of realistic loading conditions that they've done, that, that exceeds what I've typically seen in industry by quite a bit. They've used established accepted methods to convert from the actual fatigue cycle data to a prediction of airframe life. Uh, this uh, established method in, includes a, a, a load spectrum that you assume that the airframe is going to see over its life. Vans has made just an, a super conservative assumption on what that load exposure is. Basically, half time doing aerobatics and half time of a flight school exposure for its entire service life. So that's extraordinarily conservative. On top of that, the method that the using involves a, a, a markdown once you come up with an airframe life they divide it by three uh, and that's done uh, to account for statistical variance and scatter in the data but because vans already use this very large statistical sample size in a way that's kind of another layer of conservatism on top of the traditional model um, you mentioned um, what testing I would have liked to have seen. I, I think it would be really interesting to test a joint that is also bonded with ProSeal. Um, you know, Vans has tagged all the fuel tank ribs as blue parts, meaning um, they're safe as is. You don't need to replace those. And I think a lot of people are, you know, skeptical of that. Uh, my experience with bonded assemblies is that the rivets end up just being sort of along for the ride. The bond itself takes all the load. My hunch is that they were to do one of their fatigue tests on a, on a pro seal bonded joint. I think it would still be running in the machine today and they'd be sitting around waiting for it to develop a fatigue crack for a long, 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 long time. So I think uh, that's a test, you know, would be fun to see, but I think it would be uh, a demonstration that the bonded parts are just going to last forever. I made a living basically at NASA before every mission that we launched we had what was called a flight readiness review. And we brought every single person who was involved in that flight, be them be the, the, from mission control, from the Cape, from the manufacturer, from the tracking stations around the world, the crews, every single person was involved, had, had an opportunity to stand up and talk. And, and we never had a perfect vehicle. We always had scratches or nicks or dings or something that was cracking or something that was broken and we'd have engineers come ad nauseum and tell us what testing they'd done and what they'd done for a brief and when everybody was comfortable we went and flew now when i say everybody let me qualify that there's always somebody in the back of the room or maybe the front of the room who who still has some reservations but but as a general rule once everybody had 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 been heard and the, the discussion was rational, and we based it on engineering data. Most folks were happy to go fly, and that's what we did. Um, I've looked at some of this data from Vans. I'm very, very happy with the way it came out in the sense that I learned a lot of really cool stuff, which always happened in that. So I always learn new stuff from the, from the detailed engineers. I learned a lot about dimples and tracking and the like with, by looking at this data. And, and finally, I think this is just another example of what I mentioned at the beginning, which is the first answer is always wrong. And that, in that you, everybody kind of runs around saying and panicking that, that things are really ugly at the start. And we all do that. But you stop, you do the testing, you do the planning, you do the engineering. And, and if you wait before you, before you react, 
you'll discover that maybe it's not as bad as you thought it was. And, and that's kind of what we saw here. So that's kind of what I take away from this thing. Um, uh, Vic, what have you got from a, from a summary standpoint here, points that we haven't brought up? Uh, Paul, you know, I, th I think we've hit all the highlights, actually. I, you know, the big takeaway, again, in summary is we got educated. We learned the LCP is just not the big uh, monster we thought it was. Are we going to convince everybody of that? Probably not. No different than the situation you just described at NASA there. But the reality is, uh, I think there's a lot of other issues out there in amateur uh, built airplanes that rise to the top before this LCP issue. Yeah. Uh, and I do agree with James. I think I think the 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 big issue on this whole thing is communication. And you know, it's about it's just about you don't have to have the answer all the time, but communicate what's going on. That testing that we saw when we were out there, that didn't happen the day before we got there. That had been going on for months. And, and, and I think, you know, Van had the opportunity there to at least show everybody, look what we're doing here. We don't have the answer yet, but this is what we're doing. And it would have just given everybody a whole lot more confidence in, hey, they're doing everything right. Yeah. They did do everything right. And I think we're trying to help everybody understand that now. And uh, I think a lesson learned for everybody. It's about communication. Excellent. James, got a minute to wrap up. Yeah, I found that their conservatism is what made them very cautious in communicating. I was shocked pleasantly, pleasantly surprised at the level of engineering. And I learned, I too learned a lot. I expected one thing, we got into cracks, and I learned something totally, totally different. For me, uh, I have no issue personally getting in a fully laser cut part airplane with myself and my family and so forth, flying anywhere. But for Vans Aircraft, I think one of the things that they really need to do is um, change how they set the, set the flags, so to speak, set the traps for changes when they are having suppliers that are doing things for them to capture that and capture the impact, allow anyone to throw a flag on the plate. And then continue with their conservatism that they have in engineering, but share what their findings are early on. Great, great. Steve, last Last words? Well, first of all, I agree with all those sentiments, um, what, what uh, Vic and James both said. The one other thing that I would add is that, um, you know, I think initially in the summer and then with an update in the fall, Vans did release an engineering assessment document. Um, it was a very high level summary. Uh, and then as I understand it, they're coming out with a short summary presentation now. Um, but they've also produced a much longer, much more in-depth presentation. If, if you're a skeptic, if, if, if you hear us and you still feel uncomfortable, you owe it to yourself to go watch that in-depth presentation. And yes, it's like two hours long. Um, but when you watch it, as Paul said, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to come to understand a lot more than you did about monocoque airframe structures and what makes them work. And I think you're going to come away with the same confidence in the results that we have. Great. Thank you very much. You know, I know that both uh, both Steve and uh, James have uh, RVs under construction right now, and they've told me both that they're going to keep on building, assuming that they can get the parts. Um, <laughs> and so uh, that that's just, you know, supply chain stuff, and sooner or later they'll show up. But but I want to thank everybody. I want to thank our, our panelists for, for, for spending the time here this afternoon. And I want to thank all every everybody who tuned in to watch. Um, I I think that that uh, we have to remember that this whole experimental amateur built aviation concept is built on the idea of recreation and most importantly education. We're learning stuff all the time, and uh, and this is just one more of those uh, things we're going to be learning. So thank much, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, we'll see you out at the airfield.